Order of the April 26th public hearing for the City of Tampa's Barrio Latino Commission. Welcome everyone. I'm Rich Simmons, Chair of the Commission. If you are here to present a project, you will have limited time to make your presentation, so we suggest being thorough but concise. When coming to the microphone, you will need to identify yourself and your relationship to the project. The commissioners will not ask any questions during your presentation. Your project should be presented in the following order. Site plan, elevations, architectural details, wall sections. Staff presents staff report. We will then ask for public comment. Following your presentation, the commissioners will be asking questions in the same order as the presentation. Please state and spell your name clearly if you are here to speak for or against the project. Your time will be limited to three minutes, so take, take some time now to summarize your comments. Following public comment, the applicant will have five minutes for rebuttal. The public hearing will then be closed. The only comments which will be allowed after the public hearing is closed will be in response to any questions from the commissioners. The commissioners will then discuss the case and make their decision based upon the city ordinance, chapter 27 of the city zoning code, the design guidelines, the secretary of interior standards, design review comments, and the testimony given at the public hearing. The BLC can only act on items that are within our specific jurisdictional responsibility. Owner agents are independently responsible to obtain any permits and or approvals. If you haven't already done so, please silence cell phones. Introduction of the commissioner, starting with uh, Mr. Perez on my right. Jose Perez, an architect. Uh, Tom Hammer, an architect. Liz Welch, real estate broker. 
Okay, and today from city staff, we have Dennis, Dennis Fernandez, Ron Vila, Beverly Jusak, and Kamaria pettis mackle from Legal. Um, welcome to the board, Mr. Hammer. It's an honor to serve with you. Um, I don't know if you want to take this opportunity to give a quick, quick uh, intro or bio. Uh, I, uh, just a quick bio. I've uh, been a practicing architect in Tampa for the last 50 years. Uh, done his, historic preservation projects most of that time, and that's all I do now. Perfect. Well, welcome aboard. It's good to have you here. All right, we have the meeting uh, minutes in, in our packet from last month, uh, from the March 29th meeting. <coughs> Has everyone had a chance to review the meeting minutes? Are there any corrections? I have a motion to accept. So move. Could I have a second? Have a second? second. Okay. All in favor said motion. Say aye. 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 Motion approved. Uh, the meeting minutes for the special call, we'll handle that in the next meeting. The 29th. 29th. Okay. Mr. Fernandez, any announcements for the commission? Good morning, Commissioners. Dennis Fernandez, Architects Review and Historic Preservation Manager. Welcome to this morning's public hearing. Uh, just a couple of brief announcements. First of all, I do have the administrative approvals from March that I'll be entering into the record and providing to the clerk. And lastly, I did want to welcome uh, Commissioner Hammer to the board. Uh, uh, it's uh, a pleasure to have you on the board. He is serving as a mayoral appointee in the Historic Preservation uh, position. And uh, we look forward to his uh, participation and uh, expertise on uh, these matters as we move forward. Uh, with that, I think we'll move on to the ex parte and conflict of interest disclosure with our legal counsel. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, Kamaria pettis Mackle from the City Attorney's Office. Will the Commissioners please state whether or not they have any conflicts of interest regarding any of the items that are on the agenda? Additionally, will the commissioners please state whether or not they've had any ex parte communications regarding any of the items that are on the agenda? No. Thank no. you. Thank you. Uh, we have no continuations uh, this morning, so we can move to the swear-in. Uh, anyone in the audience who's going to be providing testimony uh, this morning, please stand and raise your right hand. And with that, we're ready for our first case. Good morning, Commissioners. Ron Avila, staff with Historic Preservation. Our first case this morning is BLC 22-72. This is for the address of 2708 East 12th Avenue. Currently, it's a vacant parcel with the YC2 zoning attached to this parcel. The request this morning is for a certificate of appropriateness for new construction for a primary structure with site improvements. There has been no previous action at this site. Moving to the photo presentation, uh, we're going to start with the vicinity map. Property in question is on the eastern boundary of our local district. This red line indicates the local district, so you see that it's, it's on the eastern edge there as we come to uh, that boundary line. There is no alley attached to this, and there are some contributing structures along that block. Looking at the aerial, property in question is highlighted in the green parcel here. Uh, it does uh, interact with the interstate to the south. As I stated, there is no alley to the uh, rear of the property, so they have to have their vehicular access off the primary street, which is south, uh, 12th Avenue, excuse me. Uh, the property is in between 27th Street and 28th Street. This is a Sanborn map showing the density back in 1929. Property we're looking at this morning is uh, highlighted in the green shaded area. Once again, you have the boundary uh, to the district and it is on 12th Avenue. This is looking at the uh, surrounding area at this time. This is looking back into the parcel as it sits today. Natural Resources did look at this project and as the site plan presented this morning meets their criteria moving forward. This is just looking at each side of the subject site. 
You see some markers here. They're individual parcels that have been laid out, and we're looking at one this morning. You see the cross town, oh, excuse me, you see the uh, interstate in the, in the background. Um, this is one of the structures that remain in this parcel uh, located near. This is looking down 12th Avenue. This is to the east, to our eastern boundary. And back down 12th Avenue, uh, back into the district. This is looking to the uh, west. Some more of the uh, properties within the subject site. And looking at the proximity of the uh, interstate to the property. This is looking from within the subject site to the south. Uh, that concludes the photo presentation. At this time, I will have the agent uh, address the board. Good morning, Commission. My name is Catherine Coyle. I'm with Domain Homes. I'm the Director of Land Development and Planning. We're located at 815 East Palm Avenue, Tampa, Florida, 33602. Uh, the site that we have before you, and I actually have a photo presentation too, so I'll skip most of that because Ron did such a great job. <laughs> um, and I would like to thank Ron for all of his help because he was tremendous through this whole process. Um, the first I'll show, and this is related to the site plan. This is the aerial of the block. This is 27th down here and 28th. Those are the four houses. Uh, to the east of the site. This is the site here. The front setback average, when you average from the edge of pavement to each one of the existing homes on this particular portion of the block face, is 24 and a half feet. Noting in the staff report that was one of the conditions that Mr. Vila mentioned. I'll show you the site plan. We're dealing with a very small site, 35 by 80, which is fairly typical in Ebor being small. The, uh, from the edge of pavement into the property line is approximately 14 and a half at the corner, and we're showing the standard 10 foot setback, 10 foot one, 10.1 uh, feet to meet the YC2 standards, which is approximately 24 and a half feet, meeting the average of the block. It was noted by Mr. Vila that the um, driveway should continue through. We understood it to be one space that was required, not realizing it needed to go past, which is totally fine. We can extend this through another 18 feet as we discussed with him. And we can certainly change that to a ribbon uh, so it's less um, impervious. Uh, we're showing a one foot setback from the eave to the property line here. We do have an extra foot on this side so we can shift the house uh, to the east to keep the two feet uh, needed for the building separation on the west. For historical reference, um, we drove around. This is 1607 East 15th, two-story home, small, narrow, wide front porch, the width of the um, building with a side driveway up. And then this is one of the newer ones this is 2213 East 11th, showing the ribbon drive. I thought that was good to show only because we would switch to a ribbon, just for context. This is the front elevation. It's 22 feet wide, two stories tall. It's called the Gabetto, Gabetto. Um, You'll see that it has the welcome wall and the piers coming down. There is an error on the drawing, which uh, Mr. Vila noted, and I did actually do a correction on that, which I can, will definitely do through permitting, where the brick extends all the way down, and then the welcome wall caps come out here. For reference, um, we have built in the Tampa, Historic, Tampa, uh, Tampa Heights Historic District as well. Uh, and through the ARC. So we are familiar with the materials that are needed, uh, windows, doors, et cetera. Um, this is an example of the gable with the detailing and the functional vertical louver.
along with the uh, open tail rafters and the decorative materials. And for reference, the we use, Mr. Vila wanted to know the cut sheets. We use Fipon, Typon, Fipon, I think it's Fipon, louvers and gable vents, which are for historic. This is an example of the, the door that we use in the historic district um, for a model similar to this one, um, also a 22 foot wide model. And we use Thermatru uh, historic doors for these. The rustic collection, I believe, is what this is chosen from. And the hardware uh, matches, it's typically black. This is an example of the brick and the piers as they come down and then the welcome wall. Obviously in the Ebor example that we have here, we're going three steps up. Uh, so it's an extra course, extra course of stem wall up. And this is an example of a different color brick that was chosen on a different one. I do have those as well. If you care to see them, touch them or feel them, <laughs> the brick veneer. This happens to be the general shade English pub with the corner piece that wraps. I also have examples of the top cap and the siding, if you'd like to see them. They're fairly standard in the historic districts for new construction. I do have some examples of the rear view of a similar home that we, we've done. And as Mr. Vila noted in the conditions, which we're totally amenable to, uh, for the rear visor, including the brackets that are traditional in Ybor City, which we will be including as well. We exclusively use uh, Sherwin-Williams historic paint colors. I brought along the Arts and Crafts palette, um, which we're willing to work with Mr. Villa, Villa on any palette that he choose, but we do use the historic palette, or historic collection from Sherwin-Williams. The kind of went through it already piece by piece, but the wall section, ooh, I made that too big. <laughs> uh, it is, it's masonry on the first level and it's wood uh, frame construction on the top level. Um, starting at the base, uh, I showed you the, the brick veneer along with the welcome wall. Um, we're doing the 10 inch cylinder, no taper smooth finish permacast column with Tuscan base and cap uh, per Mr. Vila's direction. Um, standard shingles and the door, uh, the thermatry doors. The PGT um, custom historic vinyl windows um, will be in both. And then up to the gable, which I showed you those photos with the open tail rafters and the functional louvers. I think that about wraps it up for me. And I'm available for any questions. We, we respectfully request your approval and we are more than willing to work with Mr. Villa and staff through the permitting process and following the conditions. Mr. Villa. Good morning, Ron Villa, staff with Historic Preservation. Staff's finding that this application is consistent with the Ebor City Design Guidelines we reviewed the plans that were dated April 6, 2022. We have the following conditions attached to your staff report on page three. Uh, the agent went through the majority of the conditions. I just want to touch upon a couple of them. Um, the depth of the driveway into the, the parcel was not reflected on the drawing. So if this is to receive final approval, that modification is need to be reflected on the drawings. There was a code compliance issue with the structure and the proximity of the, the, the wall and the overhang to the property line, it has been shifted over to reflect uh, code compliancy. Uh, there was some drafting areas, errors that were reflected on the preliminary drawings that have been either corrected or she showed the direction that she wants to go. One was the introduction of the horizontal decking on the front porch that has been removed now and the pier comes all the way down. The other one was the visor on the rear was a little substandard for Ebor City's uh, uh, direction. And then she showed an example within the Ebor City um, environment to show that it would be uh, sensitive. 
The last two items are um, the brick selection. She's got a couple of different um, selections for brick. If she could narrow down on which one she's going to come forward with. Final color selection will be uh, delegated to staff if this is to receive uh, final approval. And then the installation of the windows is the last comment. Uh, on the main floor, she's going to use a CMU on, on top as frame. We're going to look for the drawing to reflect that the installation of the window has the same depth and reveal on both levels. And so that modification needs to be done on the drawings as well. That concludes my portion, and I'll answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vila. Um, is anyone here from the public uh, wanting to comment on this case? Please identify yourself. Seeing none, uh, we'll start with some questions of the applicant, starting on Ms. Welch on my left. Um, no, I think I'm good right now. I think she answered a lot of my questions as okay. she went through. Mr. Hammer? Uh, I have a question regarding the windows. Uh, noticed on the drawings you indicated a wind load speed that put it in the uh, category for uh, large missile impact. And I don't see anything on the documents that indicate how you're protecting those openings. Uh, and uh, that would apply to the door as well. Um, how you do that will affect the, the uh, exterior of the building. So I'd like to see that addressed. Uh, we can certainly address that. Uh, we have a 145 mile per hour wind yeah. load, which is standard for this area. That puts you into the... That's correct. We use the non-impact windows and doors. Is that what you're asking? I'm sorry. Yeah, you're using laminated glass? Is that what you're telling me? They are vinyl. I believe. I'm talking about the glass. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. I wasn't expecting a specific question. <laughs> Let me get back to it. Uh, these are the ones that we do use on the other historic homes. They are... Uh, let's see. I think what I can say to you, because I have the, the brochure and the cut sheets for it, but as I would say is that we would deal with that on the building plans and work with Mr. Vila on that, if that's okay. Because we, we obviously have to meet building code and we definitely want to meet the standards for EBOR as well. Well, depending on how you address that, there's multiple ways to do it um, that will affect the, the appearance of the exterior of the building. And that's what I was concerned about. Yes, I understand. If I could interject here, Ron Vila, staff with Historic Preservations, um, Ms. Coyle, if you show the picture of the front door of one of the models that you used before. Yes. It, I believe it's a burgundy door that shows the grommets. I think that's where Mr. Hammer is going with it. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Sheets out of order here. Yes, we do the. Um, you're speaking of these? Mm -hmm. Yes. We do these uh, for hurricane protection. They're the bolts that you put the panels on, okay. the screens. So once again, Ron Vila with Historic Preservation. For new construction, this is a technique that they could use to meet uh, City of Tampa code. There's two different applications. One that it's a mail-in that, that projects out and one that has, uh, it's inverted. That's a little more sensitive than the, the grommet coming out. So those are the two applications that they can move forward with that meet code. If it's discussion of the board to move forward, uh, that is something that's been approved in the past. For reference, and now I understand where you were going with it, I actually, on my house, have the flush-mounted ones on my front doors in the rear, um, which in theory could be colored if you needed them to match, painted to match, so they would blend in a little bit more. These have the white um, rubber tips on them, which do kind of stand out. 
I certainly wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't yeah. be concerned about the color during a hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> but for general appearance, I understand what you're saying. We, we, if it's the desire of the board, we could flip it to do the flush mount. That, that's fine. So I have two quick comments or questions. Uh, the reference to the scallop siding at the gable, you had a picture of a, uh, an existing home in Ebor that has that, that uses that as a reference. The gable that I was showing was actually from a home that we've built in Tampa Heights. It was just to give you an example of generally of the look of how we actually construct them. It's a, it's a similar home to this one, um, but Tampa Heights. Okay. Ask, <laughs> but it is it's similar. Um, Have you seen a reference to that in Ebor? Uh, let's see. The closest, well, the historic reference that I showed, as far as the the siding here, the, the detailing here, it doesn't have the louver on it. But then I have different ones that do have the louvers. Some actually have the windows. They're kind of all over the place, to be honest with you. <laughs> There's a variation almost on every block. Um, and we're open to changing the detailing. It is kind of a scalloped look on the one that we have here, which we could change out uh, if so desired. This is more of the, the shaker style. We could change this out. This is more typical on the Victorian, I guess, is what we see them on. Um, so we could change it out if, if you'd like to the other style, because we do both. Okay. And then the other question, if you could put the aerial photograph again. Aerial? Okay. Yeah. That has the setbacks. <coughs> Ten feet. That was it, sir. The first home to the right. Mm -hmm. Oh, I apologize. This one's um, 19 from Edge of Pavement, 21. 32 and 28. That's your pavement. Yeah. Eight, I think. Okay. And you had 10, 10 on, on your side. Ten. Yeah, plus about 14 and a half for the right of way. So it came out, it's about dead on to 24 and a half. Okay. Thank we can you. move it forward too. It's okay. it's totally up to you guys. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. She might get my question answered. <coughs> Got it. All right, let's, uh, let's start with the uh, site plan. I have a couple questions on that. Do you have a plot plan there? I uh, do, somewhere. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Do you think you have it all organized and then you take it apart? <laughs> there it is. Okay, and then from some of the, uh, okay, so we have our 24 feet front. Are you indicating a finished floor elevation? 22.3. 22.3, and then the average, the, the center line of the street is 17.95, and we do the elevations at each corner, okay. which are the highest is 19.9. So we so, went up. Uh, um, so I guess my question is, you, you gave us a reference to the uh, four adjacent properties to the east of your property, which you've used for your setback, your mm -hmm. front yard setback. That also applies to finished floor elevation. Uh, how does that align with those other finished floor elevations? Actually, some of them don't actually sit that high. Uh, we, we took the recommendation from Mr. Vila that we should probably stick with 30 inches approximately. Mm -hmm. The um, The homes, this is the one that's boarded up immediately adjacent. It's sitting approximately two feet up. Okay. This one is next to that, it's a duplex. It's only sitting about a foot and a half. This one is sitting next to that and it's essentially slab on grade. Okay. And then the one next to that is the very end and it's maybe six inches. It's, okay. yeah. So it looks like you you have an appropriate finished floor elevation. You're following the history. We were trying to follow historic as okay. it gets reestablished. Um, and I saw from the photographs there seemed to be a lot of trees on site uh, on your survey, your plot plan. Kind of showed some, but there looked like there was a huge 24 inch. I don't think that's on your. Property. Yeah, it's 
That's the adjacent. It's the problem. direction. It's kind of that one's to the right because they're so narrow. Right. <laughs> that one's to the right. The the sign that we put up is not the posting sign, but the domain home sign sure. was to the to the right. The person who put it up put it at the driveway next to it. It's this one with the palm trees in the rear. It's a kind of a better view. You can see the palm trees back there. Oh, okay. And there's the okay. other driveway. Okay, and then all the trees that are on site, you're removing, replacing. Uh, Actually, like, no, they're staying. well. You can see it's it's basically vacant, and the palm trees are at the border uh, of the property line. Back. Yeah, so we're removing a couple palms in the front. Okay. Everything else we're keeping. Okay. Okay, let's. Uh, we haven't seen your elevations. Can we review all of, all of your elevations? Yes. Okay, so th this is the one with the drafting error. So the yeah, I showed you the corrected version, which I column can't on the left. But then the two columns on the right, outside the stairs, those are just caps really on where the brick slopes down, the concrete doesn't come through from the porch, right? There you go, this is a better one. That's the welcome wall that's there. Okay. So when you see it from the side, you can see that it comes out. Okay. That's what you're seeing in the front view is that cap. Okay, so it's yeah. flat? Yes, okay. and then that's the other side. Okay, let's go back to the left through. elevation. Left elevation. Okay, so you have two small windows up on the top. Those are restrooms. And those are just fixed panels. Everything else is a one over one. I have the floor plan. Just bear with me. Restrooms. And you're going to go with a fixed panel there? Yes. Not a one over one? Uh, yes, because it is above the s toilet. Although we could change it if need be. <laughs> okay. And you have brick piers uh, with stucco infill s or scored, scored concrete. concrete. Yep. What is, what is that? Scored concrete. It's the stucco and fill, I guess, if you want to call it that. Stucco, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's look at your rear elevation, please. Okay, so um, the overhang ob obviously is small. You propose something else uh, that happens there. Um, is that something that you want as part of your motion today? Um, sure, that would be following the conditions that Mr. Vila set. Um, if the board board is so inclined it was to add the bracing which is typical well, that one's a little heavy too yeah that that's okay, actually so. i found on a series of them yeah very I mean, very similar and i think you know if we go back you know that detail in ebor cities uh you know the overhang's fine maybe a little bit small the brackets are way oversized so mm -hmm. typically in ebor we scale that back a little bit the scalloping uh on the front and rear elevation um I don't have a strong preference for that. I think that's more of a Tampa Heights type of Victorian detail. I'd rather see a flat stock mm -hmm. okay. uh, in Ebor. Um, but I like the way that you're trimming that out with the, uh, you know, the exposed rafters and, and uh, it looks uh, it looks good. It just I think it just needs to be flat stock okay. to match everything else. It's a little bit more Ebor-esque. We'd be happy to okay. do that. And, um, so on your, we, we talked about wind load protection. I, you know, I see that on the domain homes, they do the pegs everywhere. Is that something that's gonna be more of a, like a rigid panel connection or a canvas? It's a canvas. Okay, so it's temporary, okay. We roll them up and put them in the, whatever Garage space or, they have, yeah. yeah. In this case, it would be in the back utility room. Okay, and you showed a couple wall sections, but I don't think the windows were properly placed in the, CMU versus um, frame. Yeah, this is something that Mr. Vila and I spoke about. It's, these are typical wall sections. Mm -hmm. We're going to tailor this. Um, we had the same issue in uh, Lakeland in the Beacon Hill district. We built a house over there recently as well, and okay. they wanted the reveal on the second 
floor as well. So we actually found a way, engineering-wise, to recess that window about another half an inch to three quarters of an inch, and then um, we played with the trim essentially and did another sure. quarter of an inch on the top in depth. So it came out to be almost two inches on both. So it was similar. Okay. Okay, that's all I have for now. Ms. Welsh, you have one, one more question? I just had one, I'm, I had one other question and you may have clarified this and I missed it. On your site plan, Yes. Um, you were very close. I think it was on the west side. There was only a foot. Yes, we were going side. to shift it over. Okay, you are going to shift yeah, it. Yeah, um, after discussing it with Mr. Vila, the, we need to stay two feet off of this side from the right. edge of the eave, the face of the eave, and we have an extra foot on this side, and we switch the ribbon, it can shift so, a little bit better. Okay, that's, that was the only thing yep. I wanted to clarify. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you know, one, more, one more question for you. To clarify, the concrete drive, is that gonna be concrete drive with scored concrete 36 by nine, or is that ribbons? I heard both oh, we're going to switch it to ribbons. So it'll be three, three, and three. Three feet concrete, three feet mulch, stone, grass, whatever they allow us to put in there, and then three feet okay. of concrete. And mm -hmm. we'll do an extra 18 feet in depth to put the car behind mm -hmm. the first okay. the front facade. Any other questions? Okay. You have a few moments if you want to summarize any comments. I think there's probably a few conditions that we'll look to, to put on this application. Uh, but if you like to no, address I think, anything. I think we're amenable to everything that we've discussed. Um, and certainly with any of the detailing, we can certainly change that out to whatever you see fit. Um, and I really appreciate your time. Very Thank good. you so Thank much. You. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and uh, close the public hearing. Uh, commissioners can now discuss the case among ourselves. Mr. Perez, you want to start us? No comments from my uh, no comments. The only thing that I didn't see was the lighting. Did she show any yeah, stuff? I so I think that'll be stuff that handles through staff. Yeah, I think <laughs> there's, you know, th I think these are all items that I think staff can can, think can so work too. through. Through, I mean, the issue with the you know converting to a ribbon ribbon drive, uh, three by three scoring, making sure the windows are de properly detailed for setbacks. Uh, and working with them on a detail for the rear uh, canopy, canopy. Um, and then change it out, you know, the scallop, the scallop and go with a flat. So I think there's some just some little minor, minor. drafting, mm -hmm. drafting issues that we can task uh, staff with. But other than that, I think the project looks really good. I mean, the, the proportions yeah. are well. It's been nice to have that project in that section of the district mm -hmm. and uh, make the neighborhood a little nicer. So the, the lighting was already a condition with staff for it. Okay. They always review the final material palette. Okay. We can uh, entertain a motion. So I make a, I move that the variance request for case BLC. No, no. Oh, certificate of appropriateness. Certificate. Sorry, this one. Sorry. Um, okay. Thank you for correcting me and not letting me go all the way through. <laughs> okay. Um, move to grant a certificate of appropriate appropriateness for the drawings and documents presented at this public hearing in BLC 22-72 for the property located at 2708 East 12th Avenue with the following conditions. Um, and the conditions that I have written down are the uh, flat versus the scalloped, um, moving it over the foot, moving, moving, what's, moving the property over one foot, help me gentlemen, uh, moving the property over one foot to allow two feet on the west side, Right. Um, extending the overhang in the back and working with staff to do the correct supports. Canopy overhang. Yeah. Canopy overhang, thank you. Mm -hmm. And those are the only three things that I have. What am I missing? Thank you. Um, doing the ribbon driveway with the uh, type of concrete that we discussed. Three by three scored concrete. Three by three scored, thank you. 
And making sure that the window details are appropriate in both CMU and stick frame. And making sure the windows de window details are appropriate for CMU and stick frame. And coordinate final material palette with And coordinate staff. final material palette with staff. <laughs> no, we're good. All right. And uh, whew. Uh, let's see. All of those conditions, because based upon the finding of fact, the proposed project is consistent with the Ybor City Guidelines of the City of Tampa for Oh, for the following reasons, do I need to do that part? Right. Um, what am I citing? Chapter you just refer to your your staff report for guidance. According, I'm sorry, I'm ill prepared for this. Which am I doing? Uh, is that with Chapter 27, Article 2? Yes. Division 4, Sections 27-95 and 27-113, City of Tampa Code of Ordinances. Um, Ebor City Design Guidelines. Ebor City Design Guidelines. And I think that's what I have. Do we? Second. And before he accept, um, yep. before you, yep. okay. Yep, um, um, Ms. Coyle, yes. the, um, there's been a number of conditions placed on this application based on what you've heard, those five or six conditions. Is the applicant okay with those conditions placed upon that? Yes, I wrote them all down and we agree. Okay, very good, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion, uh, applicant has agreed. All in favor of said motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Okay, we can move on to our next case. Good morning, Commissioners. Ron Vila, staff with Historic Preservation. Our next case is BLC 22-79. This is for the address of 2205 North 12th Street. Uh, currently, it's a vacant parcel. This also has the YC2 zoning attached to this parcel. The request is for a certificate of appropriateness for new construction. It's a two-story structure that's being requested, approximately 1,300 square feet, with site improvements. There has been some past action at this site on page three of your staff report. On March uh, 22nd, 2022, a variance was approved for a parking reduction from one spot to zero because of the challenges within the parcel. And at that same public hearing, uh, it was continued, the case was continued to this morning. Moving to the photo presentation. This is the Sanborn map from 19, uh, 29, you see the density in the fabric within the immediate vicinity. Property in question is highlighted in this green parcel. About 20 years ago, there was a fire at this site and it removed these three homes. As a result, we had three different uh, empty parcels. The agent and owner today developed this parcel here that you'll see some pictures and now he's moving to the north to develop this parcel. You'll see an alley that bisects the historic homes from um, I'm going to say the new construction. This, this is 12th Street here. To the, to, the, to the south, you have 11th Avenue, and to the north, you have 12th Avenue. This is a current overhead uh, aerial shot. Obviously, the par uh, parcel in question is in the green uh, shaded area. This is the new construction. We still have a, vac uh, a vacant parcel to the south. This is where the fire took place. And then we have three period st structures here. Uh, this is a substandard lot. It, it has been reviewed and approved for development. It is a buildable lot as we move forward. The one thing that the fire could not take was the retaining wall that's still in place. As the development came forward um, a short period ago, the wall was to remain as it is gonna remain on this request as well. This is just a closer shot of the historic fabric that's left behind. This is looking at the approach from the street. You have the granite curbing, the walkway. This tree has been uh, reviewed and can be re uh, removed uh, through natural resources comments. This is the new construction that was uh, approved by this board and ultimately built. It's got a CO and uh, it's occupied today. This is one of the historic homes that uh, is left behind. You see the proximity 
that will be part of the discussion today of the wall and the foundation to the property line. It sits right on the property line and probably encroaches with the overhang. This is the alley. It is an open alley today. It has not been vacated. This is looking down 12th Street to the south. This is 12th Street to the north. You see the historic brick streets with the granite uh, curbing and then the parkway and then the pedestrian uh, walkway with the sidewalks. And to conclude, this is the parcel directly across the street that the church uses for parking a couple days a week. At this time, we'll have the agent and owner come and address the board. Good morning. Hi, I'm Jay Harris. The uh, hey, good morning. The uh, agent, owner, and builder of this uh, project that I'll present today. Uh, I'm requesting uh, site improvements for a new single-family primary structure, and uh, the variance, as Ron stated, it was already approved uh, last month. Um, let's start with the, the address is 2205 North 12th Street, and let me pull up some site plan. Yeah. Uh, can you guys see this pretty good? Uh, yeah. I think that's there. This is uh, this is the entire site here. Uh, the parcel is 31 feet wide and 40 feet deep. Um, and uh, the structure, the two-story structure, is 25 feet wide uh, uh, by, well, with the porch, about 28 feet, uh, 28, 29, and a, 29 and a half. Um, finished floor elevation is 44.4. I have a uh, retention pond uh, with, uh, with the drainage will all go to the retention pond, downspouts, gutters, and ADS pipes all leading to the retention pond. And then there's also a pop-up, uh, a bubbler that's right there. So any water coming out, it'll just drain right into the uh, the the, uh, the uh, alley there. Uh, last time I was here, there was some uh, conflict with the with the uh, retention wall and my and my uh, pillars. Uh, I uh, I uh, uh, took note of that and uh, went back to the architect and we we fixed that that situation with the pillar that was sitting right in front of the uh, the steps there. Um, this is a pretty simple site plan, and if there's questions, we'll come back to it. Here are the uh, elevations. Uh, again, this is a two-story structure. Uh, the first floor, first floor is CMU, concrete block, uh, top, Top floor is frame. Um, we have well, it's a two-story, three beds, two baths, 1,291 square feet. Uh, the siding we have we have hardy board siding here. We have uh, hip roof. Um, that it's going to be shingles there, shingles on the on the roof. Um, windows, single hung windows. Uh, front door, this door will be eight feet. Uh, all window window height, uh, all window heights. They all they all sit at eight feet. Um, doors eight feet tall. We have uh, three pillars, three columns here in the front, uh, and they're pretty. Let me see if I can zoom in on this one here. Uh, pretty simple column structure. Uh, so these will be CMU block, and then they're going to be wrapped at the bottom here with brick. Uh, there's going to be a, a concrete uh, cap, and then the, the rest of the column will be wrapped. In, in the center, you, will, there's going to be um, plywood that wraps the top of the column, and then where the plywood edges meet, there's going to be one by four uh, to outline that. And uh, this, the wall that's there uh, currently, 
with the every house on this street and a lot of houses in Ebor have four columns. Um, I could not, my last set of drawings have four columns. The last column sat right in the middle of the steps. So it's going to be very tough to put four columns here because of the, uh, the setback situation. And this wall, this, uh, this retention wall extends the, extent, the, the, the full length of my property. Um, and with the, with the setback requirements, so, so I'm pushed over, the house gets pushed over three feet on both sides, and there's just no room for a fourth column. Uh, there was a house that sat there years ago, uh, and I think just like the house uh, next door, this is the alley, uh, this is the alleyway, let's see. This is the alleyway, uh, as Ron stated too, this house sits literally right on the property line. Uh, here's the end of that retention wall. Uh, with current eboard requirements, I have to set, the setback requirements are three feet in, so I won't be able to sit on that property line, which then it would allow me to have four pillars, but uh, then it would be in the middle of those steps. And the, the retention wall is gonna stay. Uh, and here's just another view of it as well. back to these uh, elevations. I have a uh, skirt board that runs around the entire house. That's 16 inches, one by four. I'm just wrapping it around the entire house. Um, also, um, all of the windows, they're wrapped in uh, one, uh, there's one by four at the top, and then I have six inches, uh, one by six pressure treated uh, here in the, uh, uh, in the middle of the uh, the windows, um, bottom of the house, the skirt board, it's uh, a spoof stucco. And let me zoom in a little more. Smooth stucco, and uh, then there's a what I have a one by six on top of the spoof stucco, and then the hardy board dives into that. What else? I'm going to, let's go to the, here's some, I kind of got some inspiration from other houses in the area. This is what my columns are going to look like. They won't extend into the stem wall because I have the retention wall in front of my house. So there's no way I can make it look like the, 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 uh, the structures unless I remove the retention wall. Uh, this is one house and here's a, here's a, another. Columns are exactly, detail on the columns are exactly the same. Uh, same. You have the concrete cap, you have the one by four with the plywood, and then the brick. And also they have the, they have the band around the house. And they have a, well, they have a porch here. So it's a little more thickness that kind of helps with that massing. Uh, it kind of conceals the, the massing there. Oh, and also one other thing that I did from the last, uh, last meeting uh, to help with massing. The, the bottom floor was nine foot four and I raised the ceiling height to 10. So those are 10 foot uh, ceilings and I kept the top nine four. And my color palette, uh, I'm going to use gray. The, the base of the house, uh, it will be gray with white trim. And also I'm adding a, a, a six foot privacy fence, uh, dog ear panel, the, they're six inch wide and they're, uh, uh, they're on top of each other, they're, they're lapped on top of each other. And here also, because the windows on the bottom floor with the uh, block, they're going to be recessed in, there's gonna be about four, three, four inches there. Uh, to have that same look and feel up, or the same look up on the top floor with the frame, the walls are two, uh, they're two by sixes. Uh, so what I'm going to do uh, uh, in the section of the window section is I'm going to place two by fours on in, uh, recessed back onto those two by sixes so that I can get that recessed window. Um, and this is the, 
don't know if you can see the detail there. So I have the two by two by four here, and then the two by six. The two by four abuts the two by six uh, wall. And let's go into this last portion. These are the wall sections. It's just typical wall sections. You have the block. This is the this is the front uh, front porch, uh, brick, concrete cap, uh, block, and you have the uh, plywood. You see it's wrapped in plywood, and the trim one by four trim. Uh, so I have B board panels, and same typical wall section here as well. Block, drywall is in there, um, and you have the hardy board. Um, uh, attached to the block first floor and second store second story uh, this is is frame up top so I'm gonna have the two by six you have a vapor barrier and then the uh, hardy board uh, attached to the to, to the uh, plywood then the uh, hardy board attached to, to that and This is the back, back of the house with the steps. Typical, it's uh, not like Domain. They had a lot of details, man. Domain's good. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, using uh, wood flooring on plywood treads and risers. We have the stringers, two by 12s there. Um, uh, we have the handrail. And it's just very, it's very typical. And then the awning over top, you know, it's two by fours. Uh, there's, there's going to be uh, uh, shingles, shingles there. And uh, these are, these are it for the details. It does, yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Mr. Vila? <laughs> Sorry. Yes, sir. Good morning. Ron Vila, staff with Historic Preservation. Staff finding this application is consistent with the eboard said city design guidelines um, with the plans that were presented. A <clears throat> couple of conditions on page three of your staff report that still need additional discussion. If this project is to move forward for final approval, under the YC2 zoning classification, the front yard setback should be 10 feet. He's closer than 10 foot to meet the averaging along that block. So if, uh, a design exception one uh, is required through the zoning department. Have you started that, Mr. I, Harris? I have started that, and the condition was based on what happened at the hearing. Okay. So you might want to put that into your motion as well as you move forward. Okay. The second um, condition that needs additional conversation is to revisit the porch, the columns, and the fenestration. I know that was a lot of discussion at the prior public hearing and additional uh, conversation should take place this morning. Uh, the wall section, he just went through uh, from the foundation all the way to the ridge. Uh, the introduction of the belt course to aid with the massing. I think the belt course needs additional uh, discussion this morning. I think the placement of the belt course could be discussed and or additional uh, architecture details can be uh, brought forward to, to break down the massing on that front elevation. Uh, the other condition that I was going to talk about was the uh, rear railing detail, but then he provided a, a substantial uh, modification to the railing in the rear. So those are the comments that I have at this time, and I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vila. Is anyone here from the public wishing to comment on this case? Seeing none, uh, we'll ask some questions of the applicant, starting with Ms. Welch on my left. Uh, could you put the um, the wall section of the, the front wall or the porch? Yes. That um, that detail. What, what I'm looking at yep. is uh, the existing wall that your columns right butt up to. Uh, it's not shown there, and I'm concerned about. Um, 
where your footing is in relationship to the existing footing for that wall. Um, okay. That detail looks like you're tearing it down. Yeah, no, not tearing it down. So uh, it abuts up literally right next to that. And yeah. I'll show you. Uh, Not tearing the wall down at all, uh, definitely preserving it. It was right. I, kind I, of a I understand yeah. that. I'm just trying to find out how the relationship between the new footing and the existing footing, since you don't show that wall. Yep. So it's not shown on there, uh, which I can have him, de my architect, detail that more. Um, but uh, so the footer, you have the, the retaining wall here, and a footer literally butts up. I have, I, I had a, uh, um, a reduction of the uh, required setback from z from uh, down to zero or, or from 10. yeah from ten to mm -hmm. zero, and it literally abuts right next to to that wall. So that's probably I guess why you don't see it there. But he could put that detail in there. So it doesn't wall the wall stays. It's just but abuts right next to it. Yeah, my my concern is not where the wall is. It's the foundation. And is it going to underpin, or are you going to do a, a, a cantilever so that the... Uh... It's going to be a footer. It's going to be a footer dug 12 inches into the ground, and then the stem wall sits on top of that footer. And then, so, and then that footer, or that stem wall, is literally touching that wall, if, if, I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly. So that, that tells me that you're going to put a footing underneath that wall. Yes. Well, right next to the that's wall. That's what yeah. I'd like to yeah. see, a, okay. a detail that shows how that's going to happen. Okay. So uh, this is the footer here. Mm -hmm. And this, this uh, yeah, this, this is the footer. And then you have the five course. I have a five course uh, stem wall. Well, coming up to the front porch. One, two, three, there's about four there uh, on the front porch. And then with the finished elevation, there's a five course stem wall there. But this is the footer that's going to be, so if he, if he had the wall there, you would see that it literally just sits right next to that, to, to that, to that retention wall. So yeah, there's yeah, going to be a footer there. The house will be. We need to see a detail how that's going to happen. Okay. Well, I think, I think our, our purview is to make sure that that retaining wall's maintained and it's in, in, yeah. intact. I think that's for your design team to kind of work through how they're actually going to do that, but we all know that the retaining wall is going to stay and we can't yes. touch that, destroy that. So you're probably going to have to cantilever your foundation, just move it in, in board so it butts up right against it. But okay. I think our purview from a DLC standpoint is just to make sure that the retaining wall is That's all maintained. I'm trying to do is make yep. sure that wall stays. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so I was going in the same direction as him. I think it, you need to show that wall, the existing wall in this wall section. Can you put up the site plan? And yep. show me where the wall is again. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> where is that wall? Right here. Okay, so there's some. Yeah. I think it it's gonna help you if you show the location of that wall in your in your sections. And even you know. If, if you can put up the elevations again. Yep. Uh, elevations right here. Uh, let me zoom in on this right. So it's not even showing in here, so. Right? Yeah, there it is. There it is. Okay. Yeah, there it is. And I think the survey is taken from probably the back side of that retaining wall. It's, yeah. <clears throat> and we know this is a pretty tight site, so mm -hmm. I just think it's something that has to be kind of worked out there. Um, and something that w I guess we're going to discuss is the three columns. Um, but can, can you put the front elevation again? <coughs> Just want to take a quick look at it. Zoom in here on this one. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Okay. You're good. I don't know. Okay. I think it works, but we get to talk about it. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, oh. So, um, since your last presentation, you did add the belt course, right, of the, you know, I think one of our comments before was that the second floor was way too heavy. We needed to kind of reduce that size. So I think adding the belt course really helps that. 
I'm not sh quite sure it's in the right location uh, yet. Okay. Um, and I think it just probably needs to be raised up at least eight inches or 16. If you look at your side elevation, that, that skirt course is right up against the window trim of your first floor windows, which is gonna create problems for you. So I think even like looking at that um, detail of the two houses that you showed, which had the belt course running around, mm -hmm. it was thicker up front where the porch is, yep. and the belt course, I can't remember if it was on the top or when, the bottom uh, there, but yeah. it just changes. So you're, you're able to wrap your porch like you want to, but that belt course is up a little, yeah, I, I'd, uh, I'd do that. They, they put, it looks like they dropped their windows a little lower <coughs> is what it was right. what they did. And then so I don't think what you want to do, I'd, I'd take that belt course and just raise it up another yeah. eight inches mm -hmm. or 16 inches, just bring it up. And then you could trim out the porch, you know, similarly there, well, so I think. Yeah, and they probably have, maybe nine foot or nine foot four ceilings maybe so right. then you know inside that gap will look a little weird with the uh windows drop so yeah i would agree with you okay. um okay so on the front elevation three columns i you know i i uh, you couldn't um Switch your, I mean, your floor plan, I think one's a living room, one's a dining room, right? You couldn't flip-flop them to put the door on the same side as where the retaining wall steps are, or is that? You mean to, to, to do what? To try to put four, make four columns happen, or? No, I'm, I'm, okay. I, I'm generally okay with the three okay. columns. I think that works. Given that, uh, you know, I think this tight is, uh, site is extremely tight. Uh, you, you've got a, a very narrow house on there. Mm -hmm. To do three columns there, I think, is, is appropriate. And, uh, you know, it works well with the gable of, of how you're doing that on the front and the roof pitch. I think it's proportionally uh, very good. Okay. Um, I, my question is, the door and the single window, can that be mirrored and go to the left column opening versus the right? Yeah, so here's the uh, interior first floor, floor uh, plan. So you have the living room there, and so and it's just wide open space. So I could easily flip the living room to the dining room, right, and change a door out. So it's you know so I that's easily doable. Yeah, I think that would probably be more appropriate because that's where your steps are coming up. Yep. You know, and I don't, I don't think it's bad either way. You know, okay. um, you know if you go up onto a porch and then you thing. you go over and then enter in that way, so your circulation works that way. But you know you have this nice retaining wall entry with those existing steps, which are historic, and then that, that would tr traditionally lead you up right to the front door instead of crossing over the porch. So, okay. I mean, if that's something that you want to change your floor plan or, or modify that so that door is on the left side instead of the right, I think that would uh, Yeah, Yeah, and they nicer. both would fit in there too, that window and, there's a window and door. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they would fit, they, they would fit in there. Yeah, I just, I just put yep. those two and put your entry door on the left side and the double windows on the right. And, and I think you worked on getting your windows aligned from the last presentation. So I think that's all good, uh, mm -hmm. looks really good. I think we, you know, with that belt course, if that goes up, uh, that skirt, that trim board goes up, that gives you a little bit more room on all your first floor window trims at the head, including your rear canopy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the rear canopy cover, uh, like we talked about in the last case, probably needs to be a little bit uh, a little bit bigger, you know. I don't know if you want to go in three and twelve, but a, you know, a six and twelve slope make it a little steeper to go up would okay. be appropriate. But. It's the same that canopy. It's the same. It's the exact same canopy. Uh, I don't have a picture of it that I use on the house that I built next door that was approved. But we can have that slope too. Uh, but it's the exact gotta, same canopy. It's, I think it's one of those things where you have the higher slope on the roof, and it maybe relates better to that. The higher, the higher roof slope, but you know, I think the, the general detail works and that's something that we'll coordinate with staff anyways. Um, any other questions of the applicant? I know we started getting yeah. in discussion. I do have a couple um, questions. On this one, the parking, so where is the parking for this property? So uh, I had, well, last meeting I had the uh, parking reduced from one to zero because there's no, okay. yeah. That's right, and I'm sorry, Ron said that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the, the so the, the, if I'm looking at the, will you put the site plan up again? Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, site plan right here. Okay, so I'm looking at the site plan and that rocked driveway, that's the, the neighbor's rocked driveway? No, that's the city, uh, that's, it's the city alley right here. But she parks there. But but, it's a, but it's an alley. <laughs> well, yeah, sometimes they park there if they have Got visitors. It. Okay. I never park there, but okay. 
Okay. You, you, I think when they bought the house, the people who, who, who renovated or, you know, whatever, they put seashells down in that alleyway. And I was like, why did they put seashells okay. down there? Okay. That, and that's where I think I was yeah. getting confused. It's like, uh -huh. okay, there's a driveway there. What's, yeah. Yeah, they put okay. seashells there. So I think they, the people thought that that was their parking. Okay. <laughs> Got so. it. Got it. Okay. That was my only, that was the only thing I needed clarification. questions okay um, mr. Harris you've heard uh, uh, some questions that we've asked you've got a few minutes if you want to rebut or anything or summarize any of your comments and then we're gonna go ahead and close the public hearing I think the biggest issue that you guys kind of uh, uh, stated was uh, you wanted to see the detail of how I would um, uh, but, uh, butt up uh, uh, to that that uh, existing retention wall which I think uh, my architect he can he can definitely show something I can work with staff on. Um, I don't. Uh, I built the house next door, uh, and I, it was the same situation, same exact wall. So there's that's not an issue for me. Um, a state licensed builder, contractor, I've built I don't know 12, 12 houses in the past uh, two years. So this is that's something minor uh, that I feel I can work with staff on. Um, and no, I appreciate you guys for taking the time to hear me. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and close the public hearing and we can discuss the case among ourselves. Mr. Perez. Mr. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think um, in general, I th you know, we've seen this case before. He's made some improvements that the board asked for. That re existing historic retaining wall is uh, an important element and I think we need to have a little bit more integration there, but I, I certainly feel confident in staff being able to handle uh, that coordination. Um, I would like to see that belt course go uh, 16 inches higher just to get away from the first floor window trim um, and flip and flip flop the door. And um, and also for the motion, um, you know, work with staff on the final material palette and they need a design exception one to reduce the front yard setback to zero. So, um, so we can entertain a motion and we'll make sure that the applicant is okay with those conditions placed upon it. All right, I'll do that again. You're on a roll. Do you want to do it? Do it. All right. So I want to go for, uh, let me find Same the right one. one. Same one, this one right here? Yep. All right, I, want, I move to grant a certificate of appropriateness for the drawings and documents presented at this public, hear, public hearing in BLC 2279 uh, for the property located at 2205 North 12th Street with the following conditions. Um, and the conditions that I've jotted down is to ensure that the, the historic wall is maintained. Um, uh, I'll just put it that way. That the belt course be raised 8 to 16 inches. That they mirror the window and the front door. Reverse those. Uh, that they coordinate the rear canopy cover with staff um, regarding the roof pitch and that they get their final on the uh, front yard setback, final approval for front yard setback. D design exception. Design exception. Thank you. I'm sorry. And uh, did I miss anything? All right. Um, because of the finding upon based on the finding of fact the proposed project is consistent with the Ebor City de design guidelines of the City of Tampa for the following reasons chapter 27 article 2 division 4 sections 27 to 95 and 27 to 113 City of Tampa code of ordinances um, and the Secretary of the Interior designs of stand for standards for rehabilitation in the city oh, I already said code of ordinance um, based on the okay, and that's all I got. Anything we missed? Second. Okay, uh, Mr. Harris, there's been a number of conditions placed upon you with this application. Um, if you can concur that you're okay with those, making those changes, and continuing to work with staff for your project. Perfectly fine. Okay, yep. great. The applicant has concurred, and we are ready for a vote. All, all ready for a vote. All in favor of said motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Congratulations. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Looking forward to that nice right. little project.
Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Ron. The one next door was nice. Thank you, Mr. I would, uh, Mr. Just, Fernandez. Uh, just request a five minute recess to, to, so the next presenter can get uh, their presentation set up.
uh, commission hearing back into order and we can proceed with the next, next case. Mr. Vila. Thank you, Rich. Uh, good morning, Ron Vila, staff with Historic Preservation. Our next uh, case is BLC 22-13 slash REZ, which indicates this is for rezoning 21-114. There's multiple addresses that are attached to your staff report on page one. The request is a recommendation from the underlying zonings to a PDA and YC9. Just to quickly go through uh, a overview of the area in question, and this is just a portion of the area in question, the agent will get into more detail uh, through his presentation. But this is the Sanborn map in 1929. You see that the lower portion of, of Ybor City by uh, Adamo, and as we come up, um, very sparse construction. This is the local boundaries of the district. Some of the requests will be inside the local district and some of the requests will be outside to the uh, south of the district. The area in question is highlighted in the green box that is associated within the parcel, uh, within the uh, local district of, of Ybor City. This is just showing the vicinity map, the overall uh, Location of the local district is indicated with the green uh, perforated uh, here. The area in question. Uh, moving to an overhead uh, aerial. Once again, uh, we have some sites here. There is a single family contributing structure that is within the uh, subject site to move forward. We have Masonite building that's also here. We have a non-contributing building that has some substance, it's uh, referred to as Ego Supply, that's by the roundabout. We have some vacant land, and then we have the Florida Brewery that abuts um, the subject uh, parcels that are gonna be discussed. The, the Florida Brewery is just to the north, and uh, consideration should be taken to uh, the density and the massing around that building. Just showing some of the uh, structures that are in the immediate vicinity or within the vicinity. This is the Masonite building, which is a contributing structure. This is the Eagle Supply building that I referenced. This is a non-contributing building, but I believe is gonna be retained. Just another shot. Some vacant land. And then to conclude, this is the single uh, family structure that is contributing, that is in the footprint of the rezoning area as well. At this time, I'll have the agent uh, address the board. Um, just before that, um, Kamaria pettis Mackle from the city attorney's office. Um, the agent's going to present this uh, project to the board members, but I'd like the board to keep in mind that this um, uh, proposal is currently still under review with staff, um, and any changes to this proposal is going to have to be represented to material changes will have to be represented to the BLC. I just like the board to keep that in mind. Can you see my screen? Wonderful. Good morning. My name is Tyler Hudson. Uh, my address is 400 North Ashley Drive. I'm an attorney with the law firm Gardner Brewer Hudson, and it's an honor to be here this morning on behalf of the Gasworks developer. Uh, with me here this evening, or this morning, is uh, Graham Tyrell, uh, Senior Vice President for Development with Kettler. Also, Daryl Shaw. Kettler and Mr. Shaw are the co-developers of this project. And also here with us this morning is uh, Alex Shaler, a licensed civil engineer with my law firm. Before I jump into my portion of the presentation, I want to just lay out kind of the, the, what we're going to talk about this morning and, and do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the first item is that at the end of this presentation, uh, we are gonna be seeking a continuance of this matter. And the reason for that is this is a very significant project. There's a lot of, sort of high level overview to provide about the general context. There's a lot of detail as well. We didn't think it would be fair to this commission to put you in the position of, of giving, giving us a recommendation uh, either way with simply one presentation. So I know continuances sometimes um, can be seen as a waste of time. That's absolutely not what we're trying to do. We're trying to make the most efficient use of this presentation. So just as an FYI, at the end, we will be seeking uh, continuance to come back with more detailed information that we'll preview uh, this morning. 
The second item uh, is time. I think we're going to be okay with the 30 minutes, but it's possible that the buzzer is going to go off during Graham's presentation. So if you would indulge us a little bit of extra time, um, we would appreciate that. And with that, let's get started. So the project team, um, this is obviously a very large project. It's, we've been working on this for, for, for years now. Um, today, we're just going to, you're going to hear from, from myself and from um, Kettler and, and from Daryl, but Cohen and Company is our transportation consultant. Sasaki uh, is the sort of master designer. Bowler is our civil engineer, and Dark Moss is our arborist. I want to talk a little bit about the first is the where. We'll get into the what and the, the how and the why later, but for, let's start with the where. So what you're seeing outlined in yellow is the footprint of what we call the Gasworks project. Now this commission is already approved, uh, city council has already approved a rezoning. This commission has already approved a certificate of appropriateness for, you can see my cursor, the area of construction here, which we've called phase one, and that's currently in permitting. The remainder of the project there is outlined in yellow. Uh, and as, as Ron showed, the, the red uh, dash line is the Ybor City Historic District. And if you look in, in, in Chapter 27 of the Code of Ordinances, it's kind of an interesting um, boundary. Oftentimes, boundaries are, are based upon center lines of right of way. What's interesting about the Ybor City Historic District is it, it doesn't always follow center lines and portions it does, but the somewhat unusual um, sort of southern, or, yeah, southern piece there that stretches across is actually because this is Fourth Avenue here, and the call in the legal description places it at the rear of the property line for that this initial platted block, and then it shoots all the way over to Nebraska, and then it again is a rear property line description there. So that's just a little bit of why, why it does happen to stair step. Ron alluded to the contributing structure. I'm going to talk about that very briefly. That's right here inside the district. So again, just to shade over the specific parcels that were actually seeking the recommendation before you um, this morning for and at, at our subsequent hearing, that's the portion sh shaded in kind of the greenish color that is actually in the historic district. But as Graham and as Daryl will allude to later on, the goal of this development is that it is seamless and unified and that someone by looking at the massings and the development will not necessarily be able to say that's precisely where the line is. So let's talk about the PD versus a PDA. So the, the zoning vehicle receipt that we have applied for is what's called a PDA, a Plan Development Alternative. This commission regularly sees PDs, Plan Developments. Um, this, I believe, is the first PDA in the Ybor City Historic District, and it might be the last, and here's why. The minimum acreage for PDAs is 20 acres. Um, it was 50 acres, obviously enormous projects, mostly what you'd see like in kind of New Tampa. Um, for this project, we amended the zoning code to lower the threshold to 20 acres. What the, the difference between a PDA and a PD, um, as you can see on screen from a process perspective, is that while PDs are sufficiently detailed with engineering details to once the city council approves that PDA, you can go straight to permitting. A PDA, plan development alternative by contrast, what we are pursuing here is a bit more conceptual. It has... And, and once the council approves the conceptual site plan in the design book, then to take down specific paths for development, you go through what's called an incremental review process, and that's approved by city staff. And that is where the specific, where, where stormwater gonna be. Okay, we know you have to have general amounts of parking, specifically where the parking. So that the conceptual detail is unified in a PD process, which you typically see here, that is going to be broken into two separate pieces in, in accordance with the code. And talk a little about the difference between the PDA and a PD. While PDs are, are far more common, um, mo most zonings of, of any complexity these days are uh, come to you as a PD, you can really think of the, that the PDA is the foundation of, of what is being shown. So what you're going to see with the PDA is you know, generally, what is the absolute maximum density that's allowed? What are the parking space standards going to be? How can we trade between uses? For example, if we decide that we want to reduce 100 units of multifamily to gain 82,000 square feet of retail, how does that work? How do we establish an overall ceiling for trip generation? Uh, what are the standards for the loading berth as opposed to where they're specifically going to be? It's in the PD. Um, PDs have those to begin with. We will provide those details to staff after Tampa City Council um, approves the, the overall PDA. But one item that is similar 
with, with PDs and PDAs is that they can be very detailed with notes to address specific situations. And, and that's exactly what we, we want to do regarding the historic structure. Candidly, we don't know exactly what we are going to do with it. Um, in the site plan notes, we are we're committing ourselves uh, to what the code requires, which is obtaining a certificate of appropriateness before we do anything. Um, I'll let Daryl or Graham speak to this a little bit. Our, our intent um, at this point is to, to likely relocate it. Um, at this point, we don't see it as a, a great site for an adaptive reuse, but a relocation within the historic district. Um, we believe there are several opportunities for that, and that's something we can talk a little bit more about the next time we're here. And one thing I, I want to note is that the the design jurisdiction that this commission has and which it exercised in the two agenda items that preceded us, that's completely unchanged. Um, to just because the incremental site plans are staff approved, any new construction, any modification, any relocation of a historic structure um, will still have to come to you. That, that, that is not changing at all. So from a design perspective, a PDA and a PD, while slightly different zoning vehicles, are essentially identical from a design approval standpoint. I mentioned, um, and then I just said we, we have, proud to have staff support. This is, this is a very large project, and given the fact that the historic district line runs through our project, um, really appreciate Dennis and Ron and, and, and everyone's work, work through this. Obviously, we're not seeking your recommendation here this morning. We are going to come back um, to explain this in greater detail, but we, we're very proud to have that staff like, likes what they, they see so far. And before I turn it over to Daryl, um, that box reminds me, with the PDA site plan, City Council will be, and you'll be recommending, we hope, and City Council will be, we hope, approving a, that site plan. It comes with a design book, and it's now about 80 pages. It is what we are going to walk through at the next time we're here. So we wanted to leave copies with you all so you can take a look at it. Um, again, th this is, it, it, it's colorful. It looks different than most zoning applications, but this is every bit as binding as the black and white site plan. Um, this, is, this will be approved with the PDA, much like the Heights, West Shore Marina District, and other PDAs in Tampa. And that is what we'll talk about again at the next, uh, the next meeting with that. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, Daryl Shaw, one of the co-developers of the project. Good morning. I'm Daryl Shaw with, uh, with the Gasworks Development. Uh, I'm going to leave most of the time for Graham to, to walk us through the development, but I, I wanted to um, recognize the significance of Gasworks to Ebor and to the urban core, and we recognize the impact it can and will have, and so are intentionally going to be very thoughtful in the process. Uh, the development will unfold over multiple years, easily a decade or more. Um, and so there will be a lot of time to work with the Barrio, with Mr. Fernandez and Mr. Vila, and with you on different buildings within the development, um, and work with the community as well. Uh, so that is our intent. It is a very long-term commitment. It's part of a long-term vision for Ebor um, that envisions the revitalization of Ebor, being part of that revitalization, um, thinking through the pedestrian, ex pedestrian experience, the importance and significance of the historic district and the architecture, the grid structure. Um, we're going to work on returning some of the connectivity that was lost over the years, um, east and west and north and south. Um, we are thinking through public spaces, green spaces, in which there's a significant dearth of in Ebor. We're thinking through bicycle paths and pedestrian paths, both within Ebor and connecting to other uh, uh, districts within the urban core. We're also thinking through how to maintain the creativity and the culture of Ebor. We're thinking through how to return the arts and the artists to Ebor. Um, and through um, something that's significant with the increased cost of construction and housing, and that is a diversity of housing. So there's a lot of thought going into the development. It will continue to unfold and we'll continue to seek feedback, but we're excited to be here today to present the overall vision. As Tyler mentioned, we're not looking for any approval today. 
We would like time, uh, you to have time to digest, read through the design uh, guidelines that uh, we've, we've drafted, and then come back again at a following meeting to have further conversation. So thank you for allowing us to be here today. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Graham Turrell, Senior Vice President with Kettler. Um, we've partnered with Daryl Shore on the Gasworks development, and uh, really very privileged to, to have been selected by Daryl to be his partner on this project, as he, as he very eloquently just sort of stated, you know, this is part of a much bigger vision for this, this area. It's an area that um, over the years, you know, was, was somewhat neglected um, and, and sort of underutilized in terms of its real estate potential. Location is fantastic, being that it's so close to downtown, but it also fits in within a great sort of area between lots of neighborhoods. So that's, today what I really wanted to do is go through kind of our broader vision for the project, um, really to give you guys some context and some background. As we've mentioned now several times, we're gonna come back at a, a subsequent meeting, we're gonna give you a bit more level of detail as it relates to the historic district portion of Gasworks. Um, but today is really all about just setting out that vision and, and hopefully you guys will see that, you know, that thoughtfulness that Daryl just talked about and the, the two years of work we, we've had to date on this already is starting to like really lay out a really impressive roadmap for the future. Um, so really for us, um, Gasworks is all about connections. Uh, that, the, the vision is, is all about connections and, and that's really connections in all the senses of the word. Obviously, there are physical connections, very important. Um, and as we talked about, this is an area of real estate that sits within a pocket of, of other neighborhoods. It's not just Ebor, it's, it's the Chandler District to the south, downtown, Encore. Um, so we're really sitting in an interesting area there that's surrounded by very um, dynamic neighborhoods already, but, but really sort of, you know, they want to be sort of connected in some, some meaningful way physically. It's also social connections. You know, we're talking here about creating places where people can come together, where people can gather for, for business, for pleasure. Um, you know, over the, the course of the last few years, I think we've, we've recognized more and more the importance of, of uh, you know, the interaction of, of people and how that, that social interaction is really important. Um, emotional connections is very much in line with, with um, your domain here, the history, the history of the area, the history of Ebor, it's, it's such a unique place, uh, not only in Tampa really, but when you think about it, it's just for, for you know, Florida and really for the U.S. in general, it's a, it's a really incredible story that it has, and, and we want to bring that history into the, into the project. And then uh, finally, economic connections, and that means just creating a, an environment where it's really you know, good for business and people to, to sort of uh, open up new businesses, to, to grow their businesses, um, to, to really um, interact and, and create a very dynamic place that isn't just a place where people can live, it's also a place where people can work. So let's start with the physical connections. Um, again, it's really, a, it's really about knitting together neighborhoods. Um, we, we already have great neighborhoods surrounding us and we wanna create a place that is seamless. We don't want it to feel like you're going from one neighborhood to the next neighborhood to the next neighborhood. And a large part of that is really through the, the pedestrian experience. You know, we found in other projects we've worked in across the country, creating that really important street level experience is the key where people will want to walk. They'll want to actually walk through your neighborhood because it's a, it's a pleasurable experience. So that's, that's really a big part of, of what we're talking about here. It's also the um, historic street grid, um, as, as Daryl referenced, I think. You know, there was originally a plat overlaid this area. That 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 plat of uh, historic streets sort of went away, largely during urban renewal. Um, there are certain things we can't change, unfortunately. CSX and um, even Nusia Parkway, to some extent, is a road that you know is is there and, and serves a, a, an important purpose. But other than that, we're really looking to introduce street grid and, and fabric that way. Um, as I alluded to, a new and improved pedestrian and bike experiences, creating trails, creating walkable streets, taking the streets that exist today and, and making them more walkable. And then also we have the streetcar uh, that runs right through the heart of our neighborhood. So finding ways to sort of link that to the street grid 
but also working with the city on the future potential for other transit options. And that's could be some light rail system that's been talked about through the years. But we think, you know, as, as, as time goes on, there will be more and more potential for, for transit options in this, in this neighborhood. So again, uh, the, the, the surrounding neighborhoods you, you guys are very familiar with here. We have historic Ybor, obviously, uh, to our north. Um, we have Encore to the west, Channel District to the south. And, and really, how do, we, how do we bring all these great neighborhoods together? The historic street grid. Um, so we are looking, if you see the two uh, blue arrows there, we are looking at two what will be new rail crossings. Um, one essentially is an existing crossing today, moved just to the north. So part of the, part of the rethinking of the street grid here is, is taking away the existing roundabout feature, which is not obviously historic. Um, and, and, you know, in conversations with the city, we've learned that that's not something that really serves an important traffic function. So there's a great possibility there for replacing that with a more traditional grid of streets, relocating the, the rail crossing and utilizing that land where the traffic circle is today for other purposes, which I'll talk about in a second. And then to the south, the other blue arrow, that would be a, a, a brand new rail crossing. That doesn't exist today, but obviously connecting east-west is really a challenge in, the, in this area. So, so the more we can do that, the, the, you know, the greater we feel the connectivity can, can be there. And that is something we've, we've had discussions with CSX on and is actively going through um, an approval process with them. Um, walkable streets, again, talked about this already, but it's interesting, you know, Ebor already has great scores in terms of walkability, bikeability, transit. Um, so how do we expand on that? How do we, how do we kind of bring that further south? How do we connect these other neighborhoods together? So part of that will be improving the existing streets, adding sidewalks, adding street trees, benches, the things that make a street feel, feel like a pleasant place to be. It's also uh, a little bit about calming streets too, right? So a lot of the streets today in our, in our area are essentially just wide pavement with, with no real sort of sense of um, geometry to them by adding street parking, by adding street trees, it calms the streets, it makes them, you know, places where people will, will drive slower, be more aware that they're driving through a neighborhood. And that's all ties closely to the city's uh, vision zero strategy of reducing traffic pedestrian accidents. Um, prioritizing bike and trail connections. So there's some great bike infrastructure already in our neighborhood. We have the, the green spine just been added to Nusia Parkway. We have the Selman Greenway. Um, our development potentially can connect those two important trails together on an east-west basis, again, utilizing that new rail crossing to the south. We're also looking, though, at another trail that would connect potentially the historic Ebor, heart of Ebor, with, um, through Gasworks and then all the way down to um, Water Street in downtown. So that would utilize um, the area to the immediate east of um, the CSX tracks and a rail spur that currently heads south from Union Station. That's still very much in the planning stages. But again, we're thinking of this project not about what we're going to build one, two years from now. It's, it's really thinking about, you know, this neighborhood 10, 15, 20 years from now. And then the transit, again, you guys are obviously very familiar with this, but the streetcar already runs right through the heart of our, our, our project area. Goes downtown, uh, currently in the process of being uh, extended further north to um, to Tampa Heights and Armature Works. So that's a great connection. We'd love to see it also connect east-west and, and complete the loop, uh, you know, if they could use Palm Avenue or some other way of getting over. But at least in the meantime, you know, we, we definitely um, see the potential the streetcar has, not only as a an amenity, um, you know, that tourists and folks can use, but really it's becoming more and more part of the way people get around the city. Um, if there are people living, in gas works and they work downtown, this could really be the way they get to work in the morning. Um, and so in, in thinking about that, we're, we're talking about adding a new uh, station. Um, the other thing is, you know, the, currently the stops, you have one stop down by the cruise terminals, the next stop is all the way north of, of 7th Avenue. So there's really a big gap in there where there really needs to be another streetcar stop. Social connections, again, this is all about creating vibrant places, gathering spaces. Um, you know, the, the, thing, the things that make neighborhoods great, right? The, the, the open spaces, or even, and they can be big spaces, they can be small spaces, but just places where people can hang out and, and really interact with their neighbors and their colleagues. 
Um, and we're thinking about that in a couple of different ways. Um, I think it was already referenced the, the existing uh, warehouse building, the, the Gulf Eagle warehouse building. So I'm going to talk about that here in just a second, but that, we think that could be a really important hub of the community. And then building adjacent to that, we have an area where we can add park space and what we're calling a paseo, which is essentially a pedestrian outdoor dining and pedestrian street. So the warehouse, um, you can see the images on the right side. That's the existing building, and those three images below it are taken inside the building. So I'm not sure if you guys have had the opportunity to go inside that building, but it actually has a really cool interior, uh, really um, well-preserved ceiling, uh, the original wood and, and the metal trusses. <clears throat> and it's a very high ceiling too, obviously being an old warehouse built. So, and it's a 70,000 square foot building. So we think it's got huge potential for, for adaptive reuse. Um, images on the left are just some precedent images of other places that have done exactly that. They've taken warehouse buildings and converted them. Um, but, you know, there's a plethora of possibilities here. We're, we're currently working through that with our design team. What is the right mix of uses? Um, but, you know, we think this could be a really important gathering place. Obviously, it would have some, um, you know, a business uh, component to it. It, would, it could be restaurants, it could be office space, but it would also be public space. It would be a place where people would want to go and, and meet up and, and, and sort of, you know, become the heart of the community. Um, we're also thinking about this building from an adaptive reuse point of view by adding new construction to it. So we think there are really good ways you can you can take that that first level but add to it and, and, and do it in a very sensitive way so that you still get that really important um, historic feel at the, at the street level, but it also adds to the, um, the vibrancy, frankly, of, of the place because by adding the density to it, now you've got people either living or working on the same location. So it really creates that sort of more continuous activity throughout the day, throughout the night. Um, it doesn't just become a place where people go for one purpose, it really becomes an all day long exciting venue. And this is a rendering that shows a portion of our um, warehouse building. It's just a little element there to the, to the right side. But it's really identifying what we're calling this Paseo. So the Paseo is, is the vacated Third Avenue, which is immediately south of the warehouse. Um, and it's a, so it's an old 60-foot wide vacated right away. But we think it has the opportunity to become really important um, outdoor space for the neighborhood. Um, again, some precedent examples on the right side. Um, we think part of that could include taking the warehouse, opening it up to the sky, um, which is the image on the, on the top right. So that's um, essentially creating outdoor space, but indoor space. It sort of creates that sort of nice sort of, uh, you know, intermediate space between indoor and outdoor. Um, but we want this to be sort of a very dynamic place. We think um, we could see uh, restaurants opening up to the Paseo and, and creating, you know, an, a really important outdoor dining area. Um, we could have entertainment in that area. It could be, um, you know, um, in the evenings that could be uh, music, activity. Um, we really see this being a very, a very kind of uh, cool place um, for, for the neighborhood. And then to the immediate west of the warehouse is um, the existing roundabout. So once the existing roundabout goes away and we introduce the new street grid, we have an opportunity to build a approximately three acre uh, park. So a really you know, significant park space in an urban area. Uh, the, the rendering to the, to the left is, is showing you kind of a concept for that and also showing the sort of the way the, the buildings would frame that park and really create sort of that, um, you know, engagement between the park space and, and, the, and the building and the activity happening in the buildings. Um, to the right, we have, again, present images. So we see the park being very, very sort of um, programmed in such a way that it would, would have a continuation of, of activity. It wouldn't just be open space where people would go on the weekend. It would, we could see programs there like outdoor music, outdoor movie, uh, movies, uh, festivals, those types of things. We're also talking, we've started some conversations with some, some artists about some um, art components of the park, some interactive elements like water features. So again, we really think between the park, the warehouse and the Paseo, which are essentially all in the same location, we think that really becomes a, an incredible new asset for this, for this area. 
So the emotional connections then are really uh, starting to talk about the history of Ebor and history and the, the sense of place that we, that we don't want to lose. We want to create we want to create a new neighborhood, but we don't want that neighborhood to feel new. We want it to sort of connect to the to the history of Ebor. We're also very aware, though, that we're in a place that transitions. It, it goes from Ebor through what is today essentially a, an area of, of light industrial uses down to the channel, down to the, ultimately the channel district. And, and we do think that um, tying these together is, is important um, in a number of ways. I, you know, obviously I don't need to tell you guys this, Ebor City has an incredible rich history. The, the, the cigar factory is the, uh, the immigrant populations that created the sort of very incredible diversity, which you, you know is very unique to to this area, um, and continues today. You know, we, we, we think that one of the great things about Ebor is its is its diversity and its creative culture, um, and we really want to sort of build on that in our in our development. Again. Architecturally, goes without saying, there's some credible uh, examples of, of, of really important architecture throughout um, Ebor. And we, 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 you know, we, we're obviously not trying to replicate this, but we're looking for, for clues and cues from these buildings to bring into the building, particularly the development that is occurring in the historic district on the northern edges, and then transitioning that through, through the development. So as we move further south, the other part of the history of, of Gasworks is the Gasworks. It's the gas production facility that sat on the uh, Tico side, which is a channel side, and um, Adamo corner. Um, so this is an old historic photo of, of that, looking from the channel. Um, you know, so this was an industrial area, and I think that's something also that we're looking at, and you'll see that in the design guidelines that we've given you thinking about ways that we can transition from the classic historic Ebor architecture through what we sort of want to still sort of recognize had an industrial component to it and, and, and you know, recognize that history as well as we move through uh, the neighborhood and then ultimately down to the south where ultimately we're going to have much larger buildings as we are up against uh, Adamo Drive or up against the Crosstown uh, expressway, so there. Yeah, this is a very different condition, condition than we have, obviously, in the north. And then finally, on the economic con connections, um, again, this is all about creating great environments for for retail to flourish, for businesses to flourish. Um, we do have uh, uh, retail as an important component of our project. Um, I'll talk a little bit more here in a second about the uses, but generally, we're thinking that you know. While this is largely a residential density neighborhood, it's definitely going to be a significant component of office, a significant component of retail. And that retail, obviously, is all about locating it strategically in a place where it works for retailers today um, so they're successful and we don't have just empty storefronts. Uh, we're looking at neighborhood retail as well. You know, I think it's important that a, a project of this size that we, we are thinking about the, the basic needs of people, grocery, drugstores, those things are very much going to be needed. Um, and then again, you know, creating different types of, of workspaces, creative office, and uh, places for local businesses. So retail today, it's really all about experience-driven retail. Um, obviously, online shopping has, has, has kind of really sucked the life a little bit out of, you know, the regular stores, but people still want to go out and experience. And, and, and what, going okay <laughs> so people want to go out and have an experience when they shop you know um, whether that be food and beverage having a nice meal in a great restaurant whether it be going to like an apple store where it's very interactive and so forth but we think you know that's the type of retail that we're, we're kind of thinking about as particularly in and around the core of the development but again we do have the need for for, for everyday needs and, and people still have to go to the grocery store every day so we're already you know looking at different locations where we can add a grocery um, and, and other types of, um, you know, mixed-use retail, where it's essentially these larger users are kind of built into probably some of the bigger buildings that are in, in, the, in the project. Creative office space, we're hearing more and more. There's a really uh, high level of interest in office users, tenants, who want to move to Ebor. Um, it's sort of interesting, uh, the, you know, the downtown traditional office space. 
Kamaria Pettisnackle from the City Attorney's Office. If the board um, would like to give the uh, the applicant more time, there needs to be a motion with a specific amount of time on how you would like how much more time you would like the prisoner to have. Mr. Graham, how, mu how much time do you feel you would need to wrap up your presentation? 10, 10 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, could we entertain a motion for another 15 minutes of presentation time, given the size and complexity of this project? So moved. I'll second. Okay, all in favor of the said motion, say aye. 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 Okay, additional aye. 15 minutes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, a lot of interest in office uh, space, um, and, and it's definitely leaning again more, and it's, it sort of builds into the same trends we're seeing throughout, whether it be residential, retail office, people want to be in sort of interesting places. You know, they don't want to be in a stuffy old office building anymore. They want to be in these sort of creative office spaces, as, as they're known. Um, so again, we think, you know, buildings like the warehouse building, for example, could have a great opportunity to, to uh, build upon that. And then finally, we, you know, we, we, we absolutely recognize that one of the great things about Ebor is that, you know, the retail, the business, it tends to be predominantly small business, local businesses, homegrown businesses. And so we, we absolutely want to make sure that within our strategy for, for creating retail space and creating business space that, you know, we're including that um, part of the um, you know, business community because we think that's, that's what brings, you know, the unique authenticity to the area. Um, and it's just obviously, you know, an important thing for, for the neighborhood to make sure that um, the local economy is thriving as well as bringing in, you know, people from outside of the area. So with that, I'm just going to transition now then into a little bit of a quick preview on the PDA. Again, as we've been said a couple of times already, we're going to come back more detail on, on specific parcels, um, specific, particularly as it relates to how we're thinking about the design for the historic district. But this is really just going to give you guys a sense of you know what the overall PDA looks and feels like. So um, it consists of um, I keep forgetting, but I think it's 16 development parcels, including the what we call the W1 and W2 parcels, which have previously come through your commission. Uh, those are the ones that were in the PD, so that's why they're grayed out here because they're they're kind of considered as a separate rezoning case. But everything else, the the yellow parcels. Um, are all future development parcels. Um, it breaks up into approximately the numbers you see on the bottom right side. So it's roughly 4,400 units of residential, 500,000 square feet of office, and 120,000 square feet of retail. As Tyler mentioned, the, one of the things about the PDA is we don't have to set those numbers today. Those are just the base case development. And those are what have been used in the traffic analysis that we've done for the overall PDA. There is an equivalency matrix, which is essentially a, a methodology by which we can exchange residential units for office space, for hotel space if we wanted to, hotel rooms, for retail. So this is a base case program. As the market evolves and, and we start to understand what the real demands are, um, that will likely adjust over time. But we, we have a general sense of, of what the uses are and where they, you know, where they ultimately will be. Um, and then as that relates to the overall density, a series of diagrams here that just show you kind of a, again, these are conceptual buildings, these are not design buildings, but these are essentially how we come up with those numbers. And I think the most important thing to, to understand in these diagrams is, is the massing and, and the way that we're taking a much lower density massing in the north. So we're looking, obviously, we're here looking southwest back towards downtown and the channel. But um, so the buildings to the further to the north, there's the C1 building, the E1 building, E5, these are in the Star District. So as you can see, these are lower density buildings. And then they step up through E3 and E6, step up again as you get close to the Salmon. And obviously, the, he the heaviest density is in the furthest um, southwest corner of, of the development, where you're getting very close to Union Station and downtown. This is a different perspective, looking now southeast, looking across the W1 and W2 buildings. Again, the W1 building is the building that just came to your commission for certificate appropriateness. Um, so that was in our previous uh, zoning case. So again, 
if you remember, that stepped up, that started out as a, a four-story building, five-story, six, and so forth. So again, we're, we're, we're trying to just take that sort of um, natural progression, if you will, of, of scale and take it through, through the development area. Uh, I should also point out, if I can point with the, the building you're seeing here, this is that warehouse building. So you can see there the, the brown piece of that is the existing warehouse, the additional construction is above that. Uh, northwest perspective now, looking back, um, so kind of the salmon is here in the foreground. That's the big gray thing. <laughs> um, obviously, the buildings that are abutting that, again, you know, that, that, I think that, we figure that expressway is like 60, 70 feet up in the air. So, I mean, obviously, we want those buildings just as a, a place to, to live or work. You want to be kind of high above that um, feature and also to be able to see across that into the, the channel. And then finally, this is looking, so this would be almost as if you're above Union Station looking back down along the rail tracks with the um, Selman again to the right, and then there's the exit ramp that comes off. And actually goes, the two buildings, C5 and C6, are actually between the exit ramp and the uh, um, main throughway. So those buildings are actually almost, you know, within the Channel District neighborhood as much as anything else. Um, and we do have some pretty interesting ideas about um, adding maybe potentially some additional recreation features under the Salmon, so where the dog park is today, and sort of maybe adding on some additional elements there. And that concludes the presentation. This is finally as a, as a rendering of the overall. This is again looking kind of south um, towards downtown and the channel. Um, Hopefully that gives you guys a good introduction to the project. As, as we've said now multiple times, we're going to come back, give you more details. You've got the design guidelines book. Um, I think in those design guidelines, we, we've, we've done a pretty good job of really trying to lay out, you know, as best we can, because obviously, you know, again, this is a project that's going to go for many, many years, but the best we can, a roadmap for the development of the parcels. Um, as a, as, a, as a partnership with Daryl, we will be developing a lot of the parcels ourselves, but we will likely sell some parcels or partner with other developers who specialize in office. The warehouse, for example, we may bring in people who have a sort of specialist background in, in redeveloping that type of building and, and, and mixed use. So um, you know, obviously very exciting project and, and uh, love to have any questions you have at this time. Thank you for, yep. for your presentation. Uh, Mr. Vila, would you like to present a staff at this point or? I just have some general comments. As the representative alluded to, this is uh, more of an overview, a very informative overview. They're asking for a continuation. Uh, this morning, I think it's important to maybe discuss and, and have a dialogue back and forth as you Kind of put this into perspective, the, the code section of chapter 27, your duties and powers on the next public hearing that you're going to look at with regards to the application for rezoning, uh, land use changes or comprehensive plan amendments is to review and recommend a reasonable land use change to the extent necessary to preserve the historic integrity and appearance of the local district. And that's on page three of your staff report. Uh, as, you, as you continue through the dialogue this morning, if there's uh, additional information that you think should be uh, put into their next presentation, that would be part of this um, banter back and forth. They are coming. They're scheduled to come on May 24th as our next scheduled public hearing. Uh, they did hand out the design books, so you got a little bit of homework to look at your design books uh, between now and then. And then uh, to conclude, you, you are a preservation board. They're here in front of you this morning to, to see how this project interacts uh, or impacts the historic district. So any final thoughts on the interaction with the uh, local district? I thought Graham did a wonderful job talking about the density and, and the massing as it interacts with the district. But that's really your role here today. There were some contributing structures. And there is one structure that they talked about doing more of that market uh, venue inside of it that is not a contributing structure, but it's still a, a, a building within the district that's going to be altered in, in a 
in a positive or negative way as you know, how you perceive it, but there's the sensitivity that can move forward with that building. So those are just some thoughts that I wanted to, to put in front of you this morning, and I'll be here to provide guidance if possible. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vila. Uh, we're gonna follow our normal outline here. Uh, anyone from the public wishing to comment on the case? Seeing none, uh, we can start with maybe a questions, uh, conversation with the applicant instead of just moving one, one item through the other. Normally we would do questions and then a discussion internally, but I think we just kind of maybe have it as an open discussion if that's okay with everyone. Okay. Uh, anyone want to start? <laughs> Let's go. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have, I have um, first of all, I want to make sure, and I don't know who this applies to, um, you were very specific about explaining to us in the beginning the difference between a PD and a PDA, right? So with that specific, specific, specific stuff, it makes me think, okay, when you guys, the way I viewed it, the way you presented it, and I understood what you're going to be wanting is you want to understand what the walls of the box look like and you want to be able to operate within the box so for every change every you may come to one meeting and present a and then you'll go back and work it and realize it has to change for whatever the reasons are you don't want to have to come back and present represent a you want to understand here are the rules we can make the modification within the rules Am I understanding that correct? Did I understand that correctly? Yes, Commissioner. I think that that's an, an accurate way to describe it, that the, the PDA is a vehicle for large-scale phased projects, again, like University of Tampa, the right. Heights, West Shore Marine District. So, but there are some changes that are so substantial, for example, <clears throat> exceeding the amount of density, where we're coming back to City Council right. and we're coming, coming back to you. And one thing I should have done a better job explaining I think, the significance of the design book. I mentioned that Council will approve a PDA site plan and a design book. The real specific purpose of that design book is so that in three years, when we go in for specific um, development ideas on let's say the gas works parcel itself, the city staff will look at that design book to determine whether what we're proposing is consistent with what this commission recommended for approval and what council actually approved. So that design book is not um, just a, a loose inspirational uh, document. It, it is what will be enforced against us when we come in with those more concrete development plans. Okay, and that's helps. what, because I'll do my homework and read through it. I wanted to make sure that I understood because you commented that a PDA is something that is not very common and that it is for larger projects as this is. Yep. So I just want to make sure so that next time I know what the heck I'm talking about. Yes, and apologies for the homework. No, you're, you're okay. Um, I think right now that's all I have, but I reserve the right to ask another one. <laughs> Mr. Hammer? No, there's, there's a lot to, to digest and review one of the difficulties I'm having with um, your your plans and renderings uh, is knowing exactly where the district line is. Um, we see the your property line. I'm looking on page seven where it's outlined in red. It's a red broken line. Uh, but there's no district line there, so that's uh, that would be helpful for us to understand you know, how this massing changes and, and goes from um, a lot of these high-rise buildings that uh, are relatively inconsistent with the district um, and where that transition and happens. Okay. Mr. Perez. Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a good good observation, and we can add that line to all the all the graphics just to make it clear. So, pretty pretty amazing presentation, and thanks for the book. We have a lot of work to do. Um, I just have two comments. I had the, the privilege of sitting in the last presentation for the first phase that's been approved, mm -hmm. um, 
And to me, the key components of that was the connectivity and the historic references, which you touch on here. And the connectivity to me um, is the key to make channel side and that that whole area back there connect to Eber, which it's not there right now. Right. You know, you have to go through that industrial area. It's a horrible. So what I've seen here, it's it's sort of what I'm what I want to focus on when when we start looking at these individual projects. So sure. That's all. Good job. Yeah, I, I'd like to commend you on the, the progress made. It's an exciting proje project. I, I think you're headed in the right direction. Obviously, it's a behemoth of a, of a project, so uh, we, we do feel it is appropriate to continue this discussion. Um, <coughs> there are, com to compliment uh, Mr. Hammer's comment, it does get a little difficult to understand the boundaries of where that goes through all the, all the time. And uh, in my conversations with Dennis and Ron uh, before on this one, it's kind of like, you know, there's two contributing structures. And, you know, I, I was kind of expecting somewhere in this review set that we had to see how that's being addressed, and it's not. So I know there's a lot of missing information. I know there's a lot of moving parts that are moving around. But it would be helpful to be able to tie in those contributing structures, the addresses, like the city normally deals with our historic properties as addresses. And you guys are looking at this holistically per block. Right. So it's kind of like, okay, which, which the house is a contributing structure and the Eagle Supply is a contributing structure. And, you know, how do those tie into your overall plan? And then, uh, so some additional clarification, and I think that's kind of the whole process of us getting our head around it. We haven't yeah. been in it day to day like you all have for years. So, right. um, I <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think as you read through the, the, the design book, you'll see there, there is like, I mean, it's, there's one page that addresses the historic district. There's a historic district map. It talks about the contributing structure. Mm -hmm. um, and then as you go further on, you'll see that the, the, we've broken it up into different architectural styles by areas that are identified. So I think once you've had a chance to read through that, it might make some, some better sense. But obviously, you know, we'd be happy to give you additional information. Yeah, they just need to be keyed in, uh, keyed in a little bit better. Sure. You know, so, you know, I, you know, I, I can come kind of follow it, but you know, yeah. it's going back and forth. And, you know, obviously the most of our purview is going to be the parcels of the blocks that are within the historic district. But, you know, I think you, you need our recommendation to go to city council for the PDA, which is the all encompassing. Yeah. But I, I like the framework that you're setting up. I think it gives you flexibility. I understand that you can interchange the parts to, to move things. Obviously, it's going to be a little bit more strict within the district. Uh, and again, with the contributing structures, so we expect to see separate, you know, uh, applications with that. Yep. Uh, I did see a number of waivers on your request. Uh, it wasn't really covered in the design, so I think we need to kind of tie in a little bit more specific okay. information <laughs> when we get when we get to that point. Sure. And I'm just having a general conversation, so my observations, but sure. Just one quick comment: the, the the nomenclature is slightly different for a PDA, and instead of waivers where code applies to us and we're trying to dodge and weave our way out of its jurisdiction, the city staff has instructed us that instead we really are letting setting out affirmative just changes in that design book that are going to describe things like parking, loading, things that are more traditionally expressed as waivers, but that's exactly the type of detail um, along with specific densities, things like that, that we're, we're, we're planning on walking through at the next um, the next okay. hearing, but that's yeah, well, well they taken. Yeah, like they were more generalities and you guys cover yes. in your overall plan. Yeah. Um, a couple, of, you know, I went through it, a couple observations. You can take note of just a couple things I saw in Incorporate, if not. There was mention of a black vinyl fence along the CSX tracks. I'd be kind of careful with that. It's still kind of close to the district. I don't want to, uh, like a chain link uh, there. Um, I think you have good integration with the Nuccio bike lanes there, uh, but that's continuing. Obviously, that street's continuing to evolve and change. Uh, I'd also look into um, DOT master plan too because they're going to tend to move that exit from 21st 22nd to 1415 so that's going to change the whole traffic pattern for the whole western side of of ybor city and who knows what's going to happen there but that's yeah. going to certainly add to a lot more traffic on that end of the district um i noticed you know you were looking for 100 percent compact spaces and 20 percent motorcycle spaces so uh motorcycle spaces seems kind of high for that um tied into some of the mobility plans, but um, I'd like to see that further. I think we'll get into further information on, on what happens there. 
Um, there's some design guidance on minimum of eight foot high clearances under balconies. I think that's way too short for the district. Uh, you know, people could walk by and start slapping stuff. I mean, that won't give you any flexibility for hanging blade signs or anything below. So I think you want to look at raising those balconies up on those streetscape pedestrian friendly corridors, the Paseo and other uh, things that you're talking about there. Um, I saw some references to like CBD design standards, and I know it's kind of a mixed bag, but we're still an ebor, so right. some of the ebor design standards need to apply. Uh, tree standards, we're you know talking about CBD. You may want to stay a little bit more ebor esque. You know, we have uh, certain more olive trees or, or uh, a more recent addition to the palette of trees in, within the district. So maybe that transitions a little bit more as you get down to CBD and. Um, yeah, besides that, those are just some of the observations that I kind of went through. So the waivers, I, I'd like a little bit more information on that when we get to that point or if that's covered within the PDA. But uh, obviously it's a very thorough and well-developed plan. I, I like the flexibility that it gives you, gives us, and you know, it obviously gets a little bit more specific when, when it's in our district. Yeah, that's it. Well, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, let's see, do we want to have any Further discussion or rebuttal? Can I, can I, can I just ask for one point of clarification? Uh, my name is Navia. Um, so there's the one contributing structure, which, which is the house. I just want to be clear: the Golf Eagle building is not is a non-contributing. Correct. Masonite is the other uh, contributing structure. The Masonite. Okay. Masonite. Okay. Which is surprising, yeah. but <laughs> well, it came through a, a major renovation, and as part of that, they yeah. they changed the classification. Okay. So those are the two buildings. And then the, the sensitivity to the Florida Brewery building there. And I saw how you kind of stepped it down, but yeah. you kind of interact with that building there that's in the district. Yeah, I just want to make sure it's clear that the, the warehouse in particular was not contributing. That's, that's correct. I think somebody mentioned it once. Right. Okay, thanks. I appreciate your time. Okay. Sure. Uh, these guys are, are scheduled to come back at the May meeting. I don't know what I, what else is on our agenda. Are we no. Uh, Pettis Mackle from the city attorney's office. They're not scheduled. They're as of right now. They're not going to be scheduled to come back before that meeting. That's not certain. Okay, date, so let me re toss, yeah. There was a date toss. Yeah, so okay, so date. let me rephrase my question. When these guys come back, uh, will we have other items on our agenda on that same meeting, or we will will we consider a separate meeting to handle? Do you know? I mean, I, I guess yeah. I would like us to think about that. Staff, That's for staff to. Staff has to, always done an excellent job, of, you know, okay. arranging our schedule, and I think they try to get everything within scheduled meeting exactly. times. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so I just we'll, wanted we'll, to. And that, it sounds like this is going to be a couple months down the road too, so we'll. I'll shuffle around. Okay. Mr. Fernandez. Uh, commissioners, thank you for your uh, patience while we've kind of worked through this unique case. Uh, and thank you for the presentations and the information and, and for, for the willingness to engage with the Barrio on such an important development and redevelopment of this area. Uh, I think uh, in, in working and kind of learning about this particular initiative um, and seeing the potential uh, for uh, both the, the benefit of the urban area, but also um, the need to cautiously approach redevelopment uh, within and adjacent to the historic district. You know, the staff is going to be looking for a number of things as this goes through the development review process. And uh, part of what I talked about with the agent was that um, there's a need for this to go back to the development review committee through development coordination for their comments and the different you know, agencies that review these type of developments, and there are many uh, internal and external reviews going on. So that's gonna take a little time. So the, obviously the May date's not gonna be reasonable, but the agent is willing to uh, re-notice uh, when they're gonna come back, and then we'll make a determination at the staff level about caseloads and the need to, to manage that uh, through a, whatever hearing type's appropriate. Um, we will be looking for more detailed information, obviously, as you move towards a recommendation uh, for a project of this magnitude uh, and the fact that we've already reviewed W1 and W2, we're going to be stressing the need for consistency and compatibility with that development and 
the different variations that you looked at with hardscape and landscape and building type as it then transitions across New Seattle and, and into this area. And I think we stress that in the W1, W2 phase of this review, and that's going to be a common theme. I think also, uh, while the uh, design uh, book is very uh, helpful and obviously going to become uh, you know, a, a requirement of the development review process, we're going to be looking for more aesthetic um, uh, approaches to the presentation and delivering information for you. So I think 3D modeling would be very helpful. Uh, there's a lot of digital approaches to being able to convey how the existing volume changes within the district and adjacent to the district that I think needs to be um, conveyed to you uh, in, in, in a more uh, clear way rather than rendering, static rendering. So uh, we'll continue to work on the development team uh, for that so that you're able to reach a decision at the end of your consideration when it does come back to you. Um, there's not going to be any action that's needed by you this morning. Uh, did you want to receive and file the, uh, the design book? So we would need a motion for that. Uh, but there's not a need to uh, motion for continuance at this point. So, any other comment? Close public hearing. Well, that's standard. And I guess we do need a motion to accept the design guidelines book dated 330 into record for the commissioners. Wait, hold on, Mr. Perez has got this All one. right. Oh. No, never mind. I'm on it. To accept, you like <laughs> I make a motion um, to accept the design guidelines book dated March 30th, 2022 for the commissioner's review. And into the record. Into the record. Okay. Second. All in favor of said motion, say aye. 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 Motion carries. And given that we have no other business, uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. And uh, I guess Ms. Juzak's last meeting with us is today, so we wish her all the best in her new assignment. So congratulations on that. And seeing no other business, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>